Okay, so uh, morning everyone. We were talking in the last class about lightweight concrete which could be produced by different methods. One is the use of foam, the other is the use of lightweight aggregate and finally by aeration. Aeration is caused because of the use of aluminum powder which generates hydrogen gas in an alkaline environment and this gas gets trapped within the concrete structure. I have not covered aerated concrete in much detail because this is a product which is widely available. You can find several product data sheets of uh, uh, many different types of aerated concrete blocks. As I said earlier, the curing is almost always done by autoclaving that ensures that you are able to produce uh, these blocks quite fast. You have a rapid productivity basically which leads to the production of uh, aerated, autoclaved aerated concrete blocks or AAC blocks. Let us move on now to shift our attention to heavyweight aggregate, the other end of the spectrum. Now heavyweight aggregate has to be used in applications where you need to make use of the density, not the strength but the density. In such cases, you can actually apply heavyweight concrete for purposes of radiation shielding. In nuclear power plants, you know that there is a lot of radiation which is harmful for human health which is getting generated. This radiation needs to be stopped from getting out and into the atmosphere and this can be done with the help of heavyweight aggregate. Now concrete with heavyweight aggregate. You could also do it with other materials, right? What kind of materials could possibly be used? High density materials, what, what do you know about high, uh, what are some metals which are extremely high density? Sorry? Steel is high but uh, probably not high enough, denser than steel. Something denser? Huh? Titanium, I am not very sure. You can do a Google check, I am not sure. <laughs> lead, lead is a common material that is used for shielding. But of course, using lead is going to be extremely expensive. So, people usually adopt heavyweight concrete because you can use aggregates within the micro, uh, within the structure of cement paste and create a composite which is essentially having a overall density which is much greater than your typical concrete density. Now, if you look at ASTM C 638 which talks about the use of aggregates for radiation shielding, they divide into two purposes. One is high density or heavyweight aggregate which is used for high energy x-rays and gamma rays and boron containing aggregates for neutron radiation. There are certain nuclear reactors based on heavy water where neutrons may be generated. These neutrons are also prevented from getting out into the open by doing an efficient shielding and this is typically done with aggregates containing boron. Okay. Uh, those are not essentially heavyweight aggregates, they have to have a property of restraining neutrons from going out. Whereas the heavyweight aggregates like uh, the iron bearing aggregates which are typically used are used to stop high energy radiations like x-rays and gamma rays. I assume you all remember your electromagnetic spectrum. So, where do gamma, gamma rays come in the electromagnetic spectrum in terms of wavelength? Smallest, largest, medium? Wavelength. Wavelength implies inverse of energy, right? So, the higher the wavelength, the lower the energy. So, gamma rays obviously will have high energy. So, they are at the end of the spectrum with low wavelength, right? Gamma rays and x-rays are at the spectral end which has very low wavelength. What is on the other side? What do we use for long range? Infrared, beyond infra infra infrared, because infrared is close to the visible range, no? it is just above the visi visible range. What do we use for long range uh, signaling and satellite communications? Radio waves, yeah, we use radio waves. Yeah. We use radio wave for long range communications. Okay. Microwave is slightly less than radio waves, but we use radio waves for long range communications because there the wavelengths are of order, orders of several tens of meters. Here we are talking about wavelengths of the order of angstroms. Okay. That means the energy is extremely high and to stop this you need to have a proper high density material that can stop. So essentially the intensity of electromagnetic radiation as it is passing through a dense material attenuates with respect to the thickness of the material, right? So, generally if you have an intensity at any given point T, 
is equal to the original intensity multiplied by e to the power minus mu x where x is the thickness and mu is the attenuation coefficient. And this attenuation coefficient is dependent on density, it is dependent on density. So, the higher the density, the greater will be the attenuation coefficient and the greater will be the decrease in intensity of electromagnetic radiation as it passes through a certain thickness of the material. Okay. So, you have to choose your material carefully and high density aggregate is used to make heavyweight concrete of densities which are typically much more than 3 gram per cubic centimeter or 3000 kilogram per cubic meter. Now, in general from heavyweight concrete, HWC is heavyweight concrete, uh, sometimes it is also called HDC, high density concrete. Heavyweight concrete, high density concrete are used interchangeably, both mean the same thing. You desire from these materials high modulus of velocity, a low coefficient of thermal expansion. Why? Because in radiation, there is a large amount of heat also that is getting transmitted. So, if you are able to stop the transmission of heat effect effectively also, that is important. But usually, the radiation shielding materials are not intended to really stop heat too much. You have cooling systems in nuclear reactors, which are essentially able to bring down temperatures of the vault, outer temperatures of the vault, because inside of course, the nuclear reactions are proceeding, which is generating extremely high temperatures. So, the concrete is going to get subjected to very high temperatures, as a result of which you need low coefficient of thermal expansion, low creep deformations with respect to your sustained loads your material should be able to resist creep for a longer period of time. Most heavyweight aggregates have high stiffness because of which they are able to resist creep to a large extent. And again, as I said, resistance to high temperature is obviously desirable of any material that you put inside a nuclear vault. So, what are the different types of radiation shielding aggregate? Now, uh, what I was talking about earlier is that you have the boron bearing aggregate right, which could be used for neutron radiation shielding. You can also use uh, serpentine, which is a magnesium silicate, hydrous silicate actually, not, not sure why it is, it is silicate. Okay. Serpentine is a hydrous magnesium silicate and that is also able to reduce the intensity of neutron radiation. But all these other aggregates, which are higher density than normal aggregate are used for X-rays and gamma rays, this is for neutrons. As you can see, most of the iron bearing aggregates are the ones which we use as material for high density concrete. Okay. So, here when you deal with high density concrete, you are dealing obviously with a risk of extremely high segregation, because your aggregate phase is now very heavy as compared to your paste phase. So, it is quite easy for the segregation to actually happen. Now, what may work against segregation is that if you have designed your system with a lot of aggregate, let us say this is your slab for instance, and you have a lot of coarse aggregate present in your system. So, what works against segregation is the fact that you have a three dimensional network of aggregate that is sort of preventing the collapse of or settling of coarser aggregate. So, in other words, we call this the lattice effect. So, you make a three dimensional lattice of several aggregate which are working against each other to keep the concrete mass uniform without allowing for any settling to happen. Okay. So, that is one thing you need to think about is that you need to design your concrete with enough amount of aggregate. So, here again aspects of particle packing may be quite useful, because then you can maximize the amount of aggregate in your system, so that they work to prevent a collapse or settling of the aggregate when the paste is added. The other possibility is using pre-placed aggregate concrete. That means, in your form work you place the aggregate first and then pump in the slurry. It is not very easy, but it can be done. Okay. It is not easy, but it can be done. 
Now, of course, you need to have ensure that you have a high enough fines content to have a stable structure without collapsing or settling. So, because of that, you need to design against segregation. You have to remember that here the fines or fine aggregate are also going to be heavyweight aggregate. So, you are going to be crushing the hematite or magnetite aggregate, whatever you are using, the coarse aggregate is going to be crushed to fine sizes. So, even the fine aggregate is going to be extremely heavyweight. So, I will give you an example of a study we did at IIT Madras for Indira Gandhi Center for Atomic Research, where we, we were looking at uh, creating a database of structural properties of heavyweight aggregate concrete. They had been doing radiation shielding concrete for a long time. They were clearly able to understand how best to look at the radiation in intensity decrease as, as it passes through concrete of different uh, 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 densities, but they did not have a clear understanding of how to design for a particular strength, what would be the uh, engineering properties like modulus of elasticity for a particular strength, can we still use the IS456 relationships in the case of modulus or do we need to change our outlook. So, here in this project, we designed concretes of two grades M30 30 and M45, okay, as you can see M30 and M45 grades with three densities 3600, 4100 and 4600. So, same three densities were also repeated for the M45 concrete. So, as compared to your regular concrete which is 2400, now you have a density of 3600, okay. So, a normal concrete was also done for 30 MPA and 45 MPA, okay. So, there was a normal concrete also done with normal aggregate to compare the properties of the heavyweight concrete against. Okay. So, you can see here how the design has been achieved. The cement content was kept fixed at 400 in the case of the M30 concrete mixes. The water content was also kept fixed at 220. So, that means a water to cement ratio of 0 0.55. Now, you may assume that this water cement ratio seems to be too high for an M30 concrete. In most laboratory studies, you can actually design optimally to get high strengths with even higher water cement ratios. So, in this case, the idea was to keep the concrete mix as simple as possible and yet achieve the required strength. Okay. So, here the water cement ratio was kept at 0.55. In the case of the M45 mixes, the water cement ratio was 0.4. Okay. The aggregates were a combination of hematite sand. Okay, hematite aggregate was obtained from uh, uh, Bellari, okay, Bellari in uh, Karnataka. You know that there are a lot of uh, mines there in Bellari. Uh, most of your steel works are also located, like Jindal steel and so on. So, they get their uh, uh, iron ore that is hematite or magnetite, mostly hematite from Bellari, and that is basically mined for extracting iron from it. But you can also use that as heavyweight aggregate. So, that is the other problem with these heavyweight aggregate. First of all, they are not easily available. Second is, they are going to be obviously more profitable to extract iron from. Why would you sell the aggregates to make concrete when you can actually extract iron from it? So, you have to have a balance and ensure that that is why uh, all these nuclear projects obviously are government projects and uh, there is a necessity to supply to these projects to ensure that you can complete this aspect of radiation shielding concrete, right. You can't for private purposes, I do not think you can easily get high density concrete, okay. The other application of course, of high density concrete is that is as counterweight. You can produce much more denser counterweights as opposed to with normal concrete. You can reduce thickness and still have uh, uh, the same mass for a regular concrete which requires a very high thickness. So, here you can see that uh, hematite coarse aggregate was used in two sizes 20 mm and 10 mm and apart from that, we also had to add 16 millimeter diameter steel punchings of length 20 millimeter. That means, we took 16 millimeter bars and cut it into 20 millimeter length sizes, okay. And also smaller steel punching 6 millimeter diameter steel rods that were cut into 10 millimeter sizes. So, all this was done to ensure that we are able to get the required density, okay. So, you can see for instance, when we go to the 4600 density, uh, for the 10 mm segment, we do not use any 
10 mm hematite aggregate but we entirely use 10 millimeter steel punchings because otherwise you can't get that density you can't get the density that you desire okay same here in 4 uh, m45 mix with 4600 density there is no 10 mm coarse aggregate there is only steel punchings to fill up the remaining volume okay so super plasticizer had to be used to make the mix compactable we were not looking primarily at pumping related properties because imagine pumping of high density concrete is extremely difficult in fact later on in a study that is about to be concluded now uh, there is a engineer from ijkar who had also partially taken me on as a co guide where he has worked on pumping high density concrete and that's going to speed up a lot of construction if you can really efficiently pump high density concrete so he's also developed high density concrete that is pumpable now that's a lot more challenging but it can be done okay so here super plasticizer also has been used to achieve a certain workability as you can see very clearly in terms of densities the required densities were easily obtained so here a hardened density of 3700 was achieved here 4200 nearly 4700 so almost like 100 more than what was required was actually achieved and here it's almost perfect right in terms of densities so again you need to do this design carefully so here the approach adopted was we just fix the cement and water contents first we fix the cement and water contents okay so remaining is 3000 uh, so 3600 is the unit weight of the concrete you remove the weight of the water and the cement the remaining weight needs to be distributed amongst the aggregate okay you distribute it in such a way that you maximize the packing right you, you can maximize packing typically by introducing a little more of coarse aggregate than fine aggregate and then based on the densities of these individual phases you can then select the amount of material so that that volume corresponding to the balance mass can be filled up by the aggregate so that is how the design was actually done in this case okay so cement and water were fixed first and from the remaining mass that was aggregate mass a distribution of aggregates was chosen in such a way that packing could be maximized and at the same time the exact specific gravities of the aggregates were taken in for the calculation to get a true volume of one cubic meter so whenever you design concrete you have to keep that in mind that you have to design for that one cubic meter purpose but it's often very easy to design for the mass that means to design for 2400 kilograms you can often do that quite easily uh, you know that okay for m30 concrete you may need so much cement and so much water remaining part you re subtract from 2400 whatever is remaining is the mass that you need to distribute amongst the aggregate and it's easy to just do a random design of 60 percent coarse 40 percent fine right but problem is if you don't take the true specific gravities of the materials the total volume of all the ingredients will not add up to one cubic meter and that's when your concrete mixes are not yielding properly yield means when you design for one cubic meter you produce one cubic meter concrete mixes are said to be under yielded when you design for one cubic meter but you get less than one cubic meter so that's because you have not done a proper calculation of the densities of the aggregate alternatively it also may mean that you have got too much air in your system okay so if you are not meeting the yield so that's why mixed design has to be done carefully to ensure that your yield is always one cubic meter so here different properties are studied compressive strength modulus of velocity poisson's ratio curvature thermal expansion bond strength stress stream behavior drying shrinkage creep so most properties were found to be similar to that of normal concrete of the same grade what i'll just show you briefly is the data for the stress strain curves that were generated in this study so here you have normal concrete with 30 mpa different density concretes with 30 mpa okay so what you see is the peak stress is significantly high then 30 mpa so you get more than 40 itself but the strain at peak more or less similar so there is not much difference there in terms of the strain at peak okay similarly even for these the strain at peak which we assume typically as 0.002 seems to hold quite well 
what you do see is different is the tail of this curve that means the approach towards failure why does this strain softening behavior come about in concrete why, why does the why does the structure not collapse all of a sudden why is there no collapse why why is it a slow <coughs> failure we've discussed this before right at peak what happens all the cracks start coalescing right beyond that the concrete has to fail but you know that there is sufficient interparticle friction because caused by the aggregate and that prevents the rapid failure of the system it gives some degree of ductility see we call this as post peak response right and it seems to be getting better when we employ steel aggregates in the system in this high density concrete when we put the heavy density aggregate or steel aggregate in the system <clears throat> it seems to be increasing that friction that causes the crack to slowly open up and reach an unstable size at that point the failure actually happens but then the crack slowly opens up and then you get some benefit because of the added steel aggregate now what about modulus of elasticity we know that is456 gives you a relationship of e equal to 5000 square root of fck now one thing that you have to ask is where does this 5000 come from why why 5000 is just data fitting or is it something else if it is data fitting again they could have fit the data against a linear data with fck no? why why a square root data square root because as you keep on increasing the strength the modulus does not increase linearly there's lesser increase in the modulus okay that is one thing that you see but why this 5000 has come about why 5000 have you never asked that question no <laughs> this 5000 comes about because of the consideration of a normal density aggregate okay the original aci relationship has e as a function of density to the power 3 by 2 and strength to the power half no it's so not fck fc cylinder strength to the power half okay that that is the original relationship and when you put in the density of normal concrete there you get a relationship that ultimately when you convert back to si units it ends up in this range in fact the previous expression that was actually used in is 456 1978 used to be 5700 square root of fck it was later changed when enough data was produced with experiments done on modulus to the relationship that is currently there now this is going to change again in the next is 456 revision right some normalization is being done for the fact that when you go to extremely high strengths this is not the data that is getting followed now so what we did was okay if you use this we are really not getting a proper prediction of the modulus from the strength values that's what we saw in our data so then we went back to this original equation what if we assume this form right and plot the modulus against density to the power 3 by 2 multiplied by square root of compressive strength of course fck is characteristic compressive strength here we have just used the mean compressive strength that we get at 28 days okay we have not used characteristic strength right so here when you plot this modulus data it's quite interesting it gives you a uh, fairly so these are the different mixes that are tried 1 2 3 4 5 6 okay and if you plot a linear relationship through that you get a fairly good relationship with uh, a regression coefficient of 0.97 indicates that the degree of fit is quite good and even if you do a confidence interval for the slope okay so this is the slope right and the confidence interval means with it with 95% confidence you can state that the slope is the true slope for this relationship right and this 95% lower bound and upper bound are given here and you can very clearly see that all data are nicely covered within that additional data were also produced with other densities and other strengths which were not from the same set right 
M20 with uh, 3850, M40 with 3850 kilograms per cubic meter and you can see that these are also close to the suggested data range. Okay. So, this implies that you can now have an engineering relationship between modulus strength and density when you design high density concrete and that can then be used for structural design purposes. Okay. Because not always do you have the opportunity to test the modulus of velocity, but nevertheless it is always important to do a proper test for modulus before you can determine that and use it in structural design. So, instead of blindly using IS456, you can now create a different relationship based on this data and that will apply to most high density concretes. Okay. All clear here? Right. So, there are several references. Most of these are of course, references for your lightweight concrete. Uh, I will also uh, put in a few papers from high density concrete in your uh, uh, Moodle page, so that you can get a good idea about what kind of work has been done and how these are able to produce the data that we have talked about just now in this class. Right. As you can see, most of these papers are dealing with work done by Professor Ramurthy's group. As I said, that is perhaps the most, uh, perhaps a leading group I would say in the entire world which looks at lightweight concrete. Mm -hmm.